I haven't done anything yet. <laughs> Calm down. Is that it? <laughs> so the good news is that when I've finished, you can all go to the pub or sit in the sunshine or whatever. And the bad news is that there isn't a hard stop, so I can just carry on talking. So, you know, I haven't got a stop for anybody else. So it's difficult. So in the battle that's raging over these two days between the, the UX people and the enterprise architects, so I've heard sort of which side of, we, of the fence are we on. I'm, I'm on neither because I'm not an enterprise architect and I'm not um, a UX designer. So I, most of the work that we do is around organisation design. We do also do work around strategy and transformation and, and um, multi-organisation enterprises, um, but we come at that from a systems theory and management science background. So we come at it from a different place to enterprise architects and UX designers. Okay? So um, when I was talking to Milan about what he wanted, uh, what he wanted me to talk about, because I'm sort of drone on forever, um, we thought the most useful thing would be to talk about the well, two things really. One is the approach that we generally use, which is the Bible system model, which I'll talk a little bit about. Um, and the other one really is about how enterprise design looks from a systems theory point of view. So some of the issues around why enterprise design is different to any other sort of design. So that's what I'm, I'm planning on talking about. So... I want to talk about some of the sort of dilemmas around design, really. So if you think about a system for catching rabbits, okay? So you can use a shotgun. These are Holland and Holland. These are the, the best shotguns that are made anywhere in the world. You can breed a dog. So these are designer dogs. These are des dogs designed specifically for catching rabbits. Okay, so these are made, these dogs are designed by crossing a Bedlington Terrier, which is that big, with a Greyhound, which is that big. Okay, this does not happen by accident, it only happens by design. The fundamental difference between the two things, between designing a gun, an artifact, and designing something like a dog, is that the dog has a brain. So the dog can design, decide to do things, and the dog can decide to do things that the designer never thought of. And that's the same with enterprises. So sometimes that's good, sometimes that's bad, sometimes that's just something. So you cannot tell a shotgun to walk around the other side of the wood and wait for the rabbit to come out. Yeah? You can get a dog to do that. Um, equally, you know, if a chicken explodes out of a roosting box and you mistake it for something that you want dead, and you shoot it, you can't get the pellets back and put them back in the gun. Whereas the dog can catch the chicken and go, oh no, it's a chicken, I'm not supposed to be catching those. Land and deposit it unharmed on the ground. Yeah? Um, equally, if you go to a show and there's a pen full of llamas, um, your shotgun's not going to spontaneously decide to shoot the llamas. Whereas the dog is going to go, there's a, only a six foot fence in the way I can do that. So the, f the difference is fundamental, that when we're designing a dog, you're designing for its ability to take decisions as well as, anything, as apart from anything else. And when we're designing enterprises, enterprises are not like artifacts. They, they have their own decision-making capability, and you are designing for that whether you know it or not. So particularly for enterprise architects, you may think that, this is about just building something to perform a function, to, to actually execute, to do per performance. But part of what you are designing for, whether you know it or not, is how that organization is going to take decisions in the future. That is, a, that is part of the fabric of what you are designing as a designer. So if you're not conscious of how that works, then you tend to end up with organizations that are not right good at setting their own direction in the future. Yeah? 
If you don't take that into account when you're designing the dog, you end up with a really, really stupid dog. If you don't take that into account when you're designing an enterprise, you end up with really, really stupid enterprises. Yeah. So that's the first dilemma, I think. It's not like designing anything else very much. And the second one is around where we start. So there's a classic view that um, you design an enterprise to fulfill a strategy. So somebody magically comes up with a strategy, and then we design the enterprise, the organization around that. But of course, organizations are what comes up with the strategy. It doesn't just arrive on tablets of stone, you know, um, from God. So if the strategy informs the organization, but the organization informs the strategy, where do you start? Where do you start in this cycle? This is not, this is kind of not obvious. And the third thing for me is around the way you think about this. So we always used to build bridges using compressive structures. So they were built of arches and the, the forces went down the, 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 the hard pillars. And we tend now to build bridges based on tensile strength. Yeah. So instead, it's the, it's the stretch in the cables or the tension in the cables that keeps the thing up. And they are two completely different design and engineering paradigms. And the same thi sorts of things apply to organizations. So one of the things we're doing in the sorts of modeling we do is look at structural tensions in organizations and where they pull the organization. And part of that is around complexity, so how the organization deals with the complexity it's got to deal with. Because that will shape the direction it goes in, and it will shape how good it is at doing what it, what it does. And there are, that manifests in several different ways. Um, we've got five main um, organizational tensions. One of them we talked about with Nick, which is about the ability of the organization to actually deliver what it's supposed to be delivering. But the two big ones, the two really, really big ones around autonomy versus cohesion. So how much freedom there is at what level of the organization to do stuff. And the second one is around run versus change. So how much the organization is based around doing what it already does and how much it's geared to do something new. So loads of the presentations have been about innovation and how difficult that is. And partly, that's to do with the fact we haven't designed the thing for innovation. It kind of comes as a, an afterthought. It's like a bolt-on. It's something, innovation, something that we hope is going to happen or we, 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 you know, we try and pull it out of a hat when we get into trouble. It yeah? it's, it's, doesn't have to be like that if you designed for it. So those tensions are, are, are there in every organization, and it's... Part of the skill, I think, in being an organization designer is in working out how to balance those. And that's not fixed through time, so that flexes through time. So there are times when organizations need to innovate much, much more and much higher levels of innovation. And there are times when actually they need to just run the thing. Yeah? And that oscillates through time depending on what's going on outside. So very, very different paradigms at play. So some key concepts for me in a systemic way of looking at enterprise design. We are looking at things that self-organize. So enterprises build themselves. Yeah? They create new sorts of enterprise. We're working at the moment, um, a colleague today has been, been um, with a project that we're working on, which is seven organizations in the UK coming together to form, quote, an enterprise. They don't know what an enterprise is yet. I mean, that's all to play for. But this is a process of self-organization. So the pressure for them to come together and act as one has come from the dynamics of the business. It's inherent in what they're doing. Yeah? And that's, that's not like... You, you, can't, you can't really do, deal with that self-organization in a kind of top-down way. Purpose setting, so organizations don't work given a purpose. If you give them a purpose, they will create their own purpose. Yeah, and they will do what they are organized to do, irrespective of what the designer set them to do. And we've seen this again and again and again. I can give you a chapter and verse on that happening. 
And we model using, looking at dynamic relationships. So we model the organization as a set of relationships rather than a set of, set of things or boxes. And the last thing we, we're interested in here is autopoiesis. So this is, this is the characteristic of living systems, that they are able to take in energy and transform it into themselves. So, you know, I've just eaten a piece of cake out there and my body is busily turning that piece of cake into Patrick. Yeah, so how is it that all, what are the mechanisms by which an organization does that? So I said I was going to talk about viable system model, and this is the second David Bowie um, set of pics we've had up. In fact, I think that's exactly the same one as, uh, as Chris, Chris Moody had up. Yeah. Um, so what we're interested in with BSM, with the viable system model, is how you design a system that's capable of maintaining its identity. And I don't mean identity in a brand kind of way. I mean what the, th what the thing really is about. In a changing environment and being able to adapt to changes in that environment that could not have been foreseen at the start. So David Bowie um, I've picked because... J.V. Bowie was a Bible systems model aficionado. He was introduced to it by Brian Eno, um, who's on the, again, Nick, we talked about the Long Now Foundation. Yeah. Um, and one of the inspirations for, for David Bowie's career and that progression of changes of identity was BSM. The other one was the Commedia dell'arte. So he sort of took it off um, the Harlequin character in that. So what we're interested in is, is building organizations that are capable of doing that, not being given an identity and just living with it for as long as that, that manages to stay stable in an environment, because the environment's going to change, but how it's able to change its identity and yet still remain true to itself through time. Um, I'm sort of preaching to the converted here, but... Um, this, to me, goes back to one of the core concepts in, in management science, Conant-Ashby theorem. Every good regulator of a system must be a model of that system. Translated into English, our ability to manage anything, manage an organization or a situation, depends on how we are, well we understand it, and that depends on how good the models are that we have. So I think it's worth recognizing that, that designers use models, and most of the world doesn't. So we are actually in a kind of different place to, to certainly most management disciplines here. The thing that we find with VSM when we're modeling is both faults of commission and faults of omission. So think we find things that the organization's doing that it didn't ought to be doing, and we find many, many more things that it's not doing that it did ought to be doing. So we find loads and loads of holes in the system. And one of the, one of the tricks in this for us is about using those to diagnose what, how the organization might fail and when. So... Traditional models that people use for managers use for organizations, um, the hierarchy model, which was introduced as a graphical model after a train crash in the US. So they gave the job to the guy who designed the switch gear and he used the same iconography, and this is what we end up with, and we're still using it. And it's terrific for modeling blame. And people tend to use process models, um, which tells you something about what the organization does. So this, for those who haven't played with it before, this colourful bag of knitting on the left-hand side of the viable system model, which looks horribly complex. So the guy who came up with it, Stafford Beer, was after a science of organisation. So what he wanted was the invariant set of laws that underpinned any type of organisation, whether it's biolo a biological system or, or a social system or whatever it was. So this has been applied to biological systems, to ecological systems, to software to organizations a lot to music to blah 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 um, looks horribly complex but I'm going to go through it. it's really really quite simple it's it's just a few things but it has a fractal or recursive structure so basically you have the same pattern replicated at every level and although it's presented as a graphical model not a particularly pretty graphical model I have to say um, what it actually represents is a set of complexity equations so the key thing for us here is how the organization manages the complexity it's, it's got to deal with. So it models structures and processes and how we take decisions and how, what communications need to happen in the organization and where information flows, how it manages performance and how it manages change. There's a lot in there. Okay. 
So it starts off, in this model, the, the, the circles are what we call primary activities. So these are the basic operations of the organisation. And what we're doing is separating those out from everything else. So primary activities doesn't mean they're more important, but they are things where the, op the organisation does that delivers some value into the external environment. So mostly what we're talking about, what you've been talking about with UX, is here. Yeah? So the users, generally speaking, in the environment, and it's about their experience of what that value is, that or disvalue is, that they get. Yeah? And uh, how happy or not they are depends on whether, it tends to be about whether the, the value exchange matches what they're expecting or not. So for us, there's a, there's a clear separation out between the things the organisation does that deliver value to the external environment compared to the stuff it needs to do to keep itself in being. So this is a university. Uh, John doing whatever it is. What do you do, John? Lecturing or do you do research? Yeah, a little bit of research. So those would be primary. Running the finances, which, which, which bores him nearly to death, that is not primary. That's just something that the, the, the university has to do, otherwise it goes out of business. So it's not less important, it's just a different, it's not the value exchange with the operating environment. So typically modelling, we either break this down level by level, say so how does this system deliver, what, it, what are the things it needs to do to deliver that, and we break that down, or we can build it up. So in the project I was talking about where we're talking about um, seven organisations coming together, we would say what do these seven types of value put together, what's the synergy, what's the value exchange at the next level? So you can build it up, you can build it down. And organisations do that according to four types of complexity that they're dealing with in the environment. So they're either doing it by doing something different, or for different customers, or in a different place, or at a different time. Yeah? And loads and loads and loads of corporate restructures are about shifting the order in which you deal with that complexity. And it has a massive impact on what you're good at and what you're bad at. So we've ch put productivity up in a factory by 40% within a week just by changing this. So we didn't change the equipment, we didn't change the physical layout, we didn't retrain them. We just made the teams in a different way. So instead of being functional structure, a cellular structure for example, and it has a massive effect because now instead of us talking that way, all the people working on a job are talking together. Yeah, and the queues go down, the work goes up, and all that sort of stuff. There are always, there is no, very, very rarely, um, a perfect solution in any organisation. So always, this is about um, trade-offs. Yeah? What you want to be good at and what you, what you don't want to be good at. So that's looking at the operations, and then we've got a set of mechanisms to build that back up into a whole system. And the first of these is coordination. So this is a set of things that every organisation needs to do to stop Operation A from screwing things up for Operation B. Yeah. Um, using VSM and looking, doing lots of diagnosis with organisations, we've got about 20 what we call pathological archetypes. So we see the same patterns of failure again and again and again and again and again in organisations. And this is one of the really, really, really common ones. So... Typically, this is putting this in place is stuff like protocols and schedules and common standards. And you know, EA does a lot of this actually. A lot of EA is about about building this stuff. Um, in most organisations, the reason we see this as a pro uh, we don't see this where we need it is because in most organisations, this is deeply unsexy and unglamorous, and you don't get promoted for doing it. Yeah. So if you thought you were going to win popularity contests as enterprise architects only with other enterprise architects. Yeah? Um, you rarely get thanked. The good news is that this has a massive effect on the efficiency of the organisation. Yeah? The bad news is that, that nobody really loves it. So if you, think about, um, if you think about a school and the timetable in a school, so the timetable is the thing that ensures that all of 1,500 kids and 100 teachers 
are in the right room at the right time doing the right lesson right through the year so at the end of the year the kids can sit down and do the exam and they've learnt everything they need to do. And that miracle of organisation comes courtesy of a little piece of paper that is the school timetable. And everybody takes it for granted except the poor person who has to work all summer trying to work it out. Yeah? And where we see the failure of coordination, you get a characteristic set of symptoms. So conflicts over resource, turf wars, so um, John and Milan fighting over who's going to do what, you know, who's going to actually sort of do the organisation. That never happened really, did it, in the coordination thing between them. Conflicting messages to customers, so Milan says, do this in your talk, and John says something completely different, and I haven't got a clue. You know? Weak operations planning, I'm not saying anything. And then appeals to higher level of management to sort out the inter spats, into unit spats. Okay? So you can see how this starts to escalate through the organisation. We, we have a coordination issue between John and Milan, and, and, and it goes right to the top. Any of this familiar? Yeah? Never been in an organisation, you can't see this. So that's, that's that bit of it. Then the circles in this model are operations and the boxes are to do with management. So we've got a bit of management here which is about actually making sure the beast delivers, that the, the organisation delivers the performance we need it to deliver. So if we've got, let's say, two departments here, each with their own departmental management, and let's say this is the division, so we've got something in divisional management that is about making sure those departments do what the organisation needs it to do. In VSM, we're talking about something really, really specific here. So we're talking about the specific linkage between an activity that's going to deliver some value and management decisions about that. So how management, in whatever form, would know that this beast is actually delivering what we need to do. When we walk into organisations, we say, well, where's your... You know, what's your performance structure look like? And they'll s they typically they'll say, well, we've got these measures. And, and you, you, you've got hell's own job trying to work out what the measures are actually measures of because it's totally non-specific. So the spinal relationship in any organisation is this one. It's about agreeing performance. Yeah? The relationship about agreeing performance. How that performance is measured and balancing that, an agreement about resource. So the basic deal is, you can have 45 minutes to deliver this talk on. Yeah? Is that enough? Can we do it? Yeah? And we have a de debate about what can be done in the time. Yes? The problem comes that very often, well, several problems with it, but one comes that very often in organisation this is fragmented. So I end up having a conversation with John about the time and with Milan about the performance, and it's John's interest to screw me on the time, and it's Milan's interest to screw me on the performance. Yeah? And I ended up, I ended up sandwiched in the middle. You can tell this is heartfelt, can't you? So this is, generally speaking, the, the quickest way to break an individual or a team in an organisation. I've got a mate who's an occupational physician, um, so he gets called in, particularly with cases of stress in, in organisations. One of his clients broke 13 people in the same role before they started to notice the pattern. Yeah? And the same thing happens with, with whole departments. Yeah? Um, sadly, this is not just fractured in practice, it's fractured in theory. So um, I do a lot of work with the, in the performance management field and uh, go to the Performance Management Association conferences. There's one happens every two years. It's at the end of this month in Edinburgh. The last time it was in Edinburgh, I went along. There were 300 papers, all about performance management. Two mentioned resources. Yeah. So in, in theory, in management theory, these two things are completely separated. Yeah. And very often in management practice, they are separated as well. And this is not rocket science, you know, if you don't get the resource, you ain't going to deliver the performance. This is, not, this is not hard, is it? You know, this is just common sense. One of the other things that goes wrong is, is, a, is a kind of temporal thing or, or a change thing. So, 
This is the, this is the uh, second of my, our sort of really, really common archetypes. Something happens to change the demand from the environment. Yeah, so the world changes, a little bit or a lot. And the operations guys react to that. Management somewhere up the chain panics because suddenly they realise that something's going on that they don't quite understand. And the almost invariant response is to ask for more and more reporting. Yeah? So they descend like a ton of bricks on the poor operations guys and want more and more information. And you get a double hit because the operations guys then are spending half their time trying to fight off senior management and the other half trying to deal with the, the changes that they're dealing with. Yeah? And uh, I've never been in an organisation where you can't see this happening. So if it hasn't happened to you, you, you're really, really lucky. The way out of it is structural. So it's this little known thing called the monitoring loop. So this goes down from one level of management bypasses another level of management and looks at what qualitatively what is actually going on in the operations. Part of the reason for this is to ensure that when we get performance reports we actually understand what they mean and it's about deepening your, your understanding of what happens in, in, in the organisation. So I was doing an exercise with Greater Manchester Fire and Rescue and we had the number two in the workshop and I'd, I hadn't asked him the question before but I knew what sort of guy he was. And I turned to him and said, um, you still go out on, on shout. A shout is when they go to a, a, a fire. And he said, uh, yes, of course I do. Why would you do that? He said, I have to know what it's like for the guys. Because I was last a proper fireman 15 years ago, and so much has changed. So I have to know what their life is like, what it's like for them in, in, in the reality of it. Yeah. And without that, you cannot take good decisions as, as a manager. So done well, this builds trust in organisations, and done badly, it'll destroy it faster than anything you can imagine. Yeah. So, and this works both ways. Had a, a client who was um, two clients, two, two women actually, um, who were best mates in an organisation, and one of them got promoted to director. So now she was the the boss of the other one, and within about just over a month, their relationship had completely broken down because the director didn't do monitoring. So what happened was she was coming up with strategy for the manager's department and the staff in the department were going, well, we've never seen her. She doesn't know what we do. Why would we buy the strategy that she's coming up with? Because how would she know? The manager is, is now trapped between the staff, who are the ones who are going to deliver or not, and the director. Yeah? Which way does she go? She goes with the staff. Yeah. And the relationship with the director broke down really, really fast. This is, this is taught almost nowhere in management. don't know why. So in VSM, the, the, the whole mechanism around managing performance is really, really quite simple. We've got a relationship around linking operations to decisions. So the actual performance of the thing, agreeing and measuring that, agreeing the resources, and monitoring to check that it works. Really simple. Yeah, not hard. Then we've got part of management, which is about looking outside and into the future. This is very, very different in type. So different types of people tend to be good at this. So this is stuff like surveying technical, competitive market uh, environments, predicting, planning, creating the future, R&D, innovation, strategic risk, that sort of stuff. It's a very, very different information set, and it's a very, very different mindset to do it. vanishingly small in some organisations. So the, the last of the archetypes that I'm going to talk of, the pathological archetypes, is this one. So in many organisations, this is either incredibly weak or totally missing. So I've got a mate who's uh, an enterprise architect, and he was working for a reasonably big firm of consultants, 40,000 consultants, which is, you know, I mean, it's not IBM, obviously, you know, but who's that big? Um, but it's big enough. And he went along to the technical director and he said, I think we need some capability around developing next practice. And the guy said, absolutely right, and you're the man to do it, Richard. So they got 40,000 guys out there earning money, doing the delivery, doing the operations. They could not find the money to pay for one person to do R&D. And that's how out of balance this can get. 
Yeah? So, characteristic set of symptoms when it goes wrong. The one that's really scary for me is this, is strategic risk. Okay? So, the S&P 500, the top 500 companies in the US, of those, of the starting S&P 500, 85% have gone out of business in 40 years. So this is 2000, this is 10 years ago, this is 2006 figures, so this is pre-economic crash, yeah? This is just normal. Again, 2006 figures of the top 1,000 companies in the world, half of the ones that survived lost 20% of their value in a one-month period at, s at some time in a decade, yeah? So this level of turbulence and upset from the world outside is normal, and it's fatal to organizations. 35% of fatal strategic risk came from a direction they weren't even, they hadn't even thought to look in. You know, you've got to be looking where the lions are because they're there. Yeah. So for us in VSM, decision making, and I'm focusing on this because for me this is a thing that, that um, is kind of missing in, in EA, I think, with, with all due respect to the EA colleagues here is about getting the balance right. So the balance between the external and the internal information, the future and now. And these are, from an EA point of view, informational issues. Yeah? Do we actually have the information we need? Um, again, in performance, um, this is generally done totally the wrong way around. So we tend to design performance measures as an output of strategy. Um, should always design performance measures as an input. So, I mean, what use is a strategy if it's not based on how good we are at what we do? Yeah. And again, the fractal thing articulated through the organisation. So this uh, done through every level. This um, genial old cove here is, is Warren McCulloch. So Warren's the guy who um, did all the research work on neural networks, or the initial research work on neural networks. And this is redundancy of potential command principle. In any complex decision network, the ability to act effectively depends on an adequate concatenation of information, having the right information mixed together. My corollary to that, the Patrick Hoverstadt corollary, is organizations tend to take the decisions they've got the information to take. It's not an absolute predictor, but I reckon it's about 80%, it's right about 80% of the time. If you look at the information that decision makers have got, they you can generally predict the decision they're going to take. So from an EA point of view, you are not totally determining, but seriously influencing the future direction of the organization by the information that you design. Yeah? That's happening whether you know it or not. If you're designing stupid dogs, it's because you're not thinking about designing intelligent ones. Yeah. So for us, we do decision-centric design. Can I try? You can if you want, if you're brave. Yes. Is that a challenge? No, <laughs> but I think the understanding part is very important. You need to train it right. If you're training yeah, absolutely. It, but I mean, I mean, if we're talking... Yeah, 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 yeah. But I mean, do you remember when the shuttle crashed and it was the O-rings? Yeah? And the O-rings froze. It was too cold a day. And the O-rings froze and the fuel came out. And <laughs> they knew that. Okay? They were not able to get it across to the management team that the O-rings were going to freeze. Yeah? So there is, a, there is an issue about transduction. And actually, that's a UX question, isn't it? You know? I mean, it's not what UX people generally do, but it is, a, it is the sort of problem that UX deals with. Yeah? That's a cop-out. That's a cop-out. So for me, designing that balance is partly around information types, it's partly around channels, it's partly about transducers, which is, can it be understood? Yeah, that's, that's our code for that. It's partly around personality types, so different people think in different ways. And part of the problem of designing organisations so they can do, run well, and change well, is that the types of people you get in the board 
are very, very different, and it's really hard to hold that tension in a board. Yeah? So that's VSM. It's a model for how organizations can be ultra-stable, so how they can adapt to changes that couldn't have been envisaged. You've got, it's a fractal model, um, which means you've got exactly the same mechanisms at every level. If you can design a team, you can design a department, you can design a division, you can design the corporation, you can design an enterprise made of seven corporations. It's really, really simple. Um, it's in, as a design and a diagnostic tool, it's incredibly fast and very ultimately scalable. So um, the multi-organization project I mentioned earlier, that's um, just under half a million people not counting the supply chains. If you count the supply chains, it's probably double that. Yeah, for us, that's no harder modeling task than modeling one of the organizations, you know? So we've done work up to whole sectors using this. It's, it's really, really, really quick. Have I got time for a couple of cases or not? Do you want to stop? Couple, quick. Oh, sorry. So, so this is a typical um, design process for us. You start with, you know, why we're doing it, and there are different ways of tackling that. Then choose the operating structure, then look at coordination, and then the design for management information structure. But we iterate through that. So three will always influence two very, very heavily. 